What's up everybody, welcome back once again to Axel's Analysis. As always, I'm the host, the man who's too cheap to make up his own name, so that's still one Axel Mulligan. NXT for the 10th of July 2014. Our commentators this week, we have Rich Brennan, Renee Young, who didn't piss me off as much as she normally does this week, and the returning Jason Albert, who's been gone for so long they started to put his face on milk cards to ask if anybody knows of his whereabouts. He's back. He did piss me off a little bit, though, Jason Albert. He pissed me off more than Renee Young did, actually. And I like Albert as a commentator. Um, first match of the night was Bailey versus Summer Rae, and he kept asking people for hugs. When the hell, aside from his like gimmick with Brodus Clay, when the hell did Jason Albert, Matt Bloom, A-Train, Albert, Tensai, whatever the hell you want to call it, when the hell did he ever want a hug? He didn't. He wanted to kick the shit out of people. I don't like the watered-down version of him. You know, it just doesn't do much for me. As I say, I like him as a commentator, but is I like bubbles that he does and can I have a hug? You know Matt Bloom, you were a monster in the ring in your day as the A Train character. You're killing yourself, mate, honestly. Just stick to doing what you do best on commentary. Call in the matches, call in the moves. You know, I don't mind guys having a bit of character on commentary, but that's just the wrong character, in my opinion, for Jason Albert to have. Anybody who's got a different opinion, just let me know. I do like, I do listen to everybody's opinions, as I've said before. I do appreciate that people have got an opinion, and I do respect people's opinions if they can back up what they're saying. But, as I say, if you've got any opinions, just leave a comment below or send me a tweet on Twitter at Axel Mulligan. Uh, first match of the night. I say Bailey versus Samurai first sorry for a number one contenders match or this was the number one contenders match rather for the women's championship and it wasn't a great match there's a few sloppy moves um, from both girls really and it's a shame because there's two two very good wrestlers and it annoyed me there was there the two main things that pissed me off about the match were Summer twice tried to pin Bailey and on two occasions, Bailey's shoulder was up, and it's it's a it's a botched spot for me. You know, wrestling is choreographed, and if it's, it should be planned, it should be pre-planned, and everything that happens should be perfect for me. Not not necessarily perfect, but it should flow well and it should work well. If somebody's trying to pin you. Don't leave your shoulder off the mat. Just get your shoulders down. If it's, if you're only supposed to have a two count, then you get your shoulder up. But it, it pissed me off, as I said, because they're two good wrestlers. And it was it was a very sloppily wrestled match. You know, there was a spot where Bailey tried to roll up Summer. She sort of had her ass on uh, Summer's hamstrings as her shoulders were on the mat. And even that was sloppy, you know. just It just didn't flow very well, the match. And it's a shame because in the past they've had decent chemistry, but just this this wasn't the night. This wasn't night for them, the night for them, unfortunately. But um, summer one with uh, her finishing move. I forget what it's called now. Sort of the leg drop across the throat that the Big Show used to do a few years ago. Uh, and this was one of those ones where Bailey didn't have her shoulders down initially. And Summer looked pissed off at the referee for some reason because he wouldn't call or he wouldn't count. When she was, when she had the pin down, but the referee's right to not count, you know. People aren't stupid. People are going to notice, like people in the arena, fans are going to notice when Bailey's shoulder was down. You know, it just didn't make sense why Summer looked pissed off at the referee, but hey, hey. She's the new number one contender. That match takes place in two weeks' time. Uh, obviously the two former, two thirds of the former group known as the BFFs. But no, it should be a good match, you know, as I've said, Charlotte's improved a lot in the ring recently over the last few months. And Summer, she's she's a great wrestler. Well, not great wrestler, she is a very good wrestler, so you know, it's a match I'm looking forward to seeing. I'm just hoping that Sasha Banks gets involved somehow in as like a referee or if she gets involved to cause a disqualification which leads to a triple threat at the next live show. I don't know, we'll see. But I'm hoping that if if they do have this triple threat match that I've been hoping for that Sasha doesn't win because I want her to be the next one called up to the main roster. Um, I don't think that'll be at any time soon, but 
I'm hoping maybe in the next six months or so. When I say soon, I mean the next four to eight weeks. I'm hoping, like, maybe by the Royal Rumble, she'll be up on the main roster. Maybe put her in a tag team with someone like Alicia Fox. If Alicia can drop this crappy, stone-cold Alicia Fox gimmick and sort of cross with John Hyde and Wright's nuttiness, you know, I'm hoping that they, they can make a good team on the main roster. You don't get many women's tag teams. And you never know. If, if if they do get enough women up on the main roster, you know, they've got some good things going out there at the moment, to be fair. So, you never know. They could see, like, a, a women's tag team or a Divas tag team division, which would be quite interesting to see. Uh, the next segment of the night, we had two little interviews. We had one where, where Sami Zayn, it was like a pre-recorded thing from WWE.com last week. Sami Zayn and Nadra and Neville, uh, and they both basically say that they're not surprised that Tyson's true colours are starting to come out with the way that he's been acting for the last couple of months. Um, but they're surprised that Justin Gabriel was so easy for Tyson to manipulate. Obviously last week, to sort of close out the show, Neville saved Zayn from a beatdown from uh, the reformed international airstrike. Uh, the next interview was Devin Taylor. She was interviewing Justin Gabriel and Tyson Kidd. She asked Justin uh, what was going through his head last week when he sort of, when he was attacking Sami Zayn. He basically said, you know, he started in NXT four years ago. He's had to go back there now to sort of rebuild himself. But he says, as much as there are great talents in NXT, and he named Neville and Zayn as two of them. And Tyson's are like looking along all together like. Nah, nah, shut up. You, or not shut up, he's just sort of like, nah, 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 nobody's better than us, Justin. Justin did turn around and say, you know, Zane and Neville aren't on his level. They don't have his in-ring skills, they don't have his looks, you know. Typical sort of New Hill uh, promo, really, where he's sort of slating guys who he thinks he's better than. And to be fair, there's not many people in NXT that are better than Justin Gabriel. Devin, uh, like Justin walked up and Devin tried to ask Tyson a question, but just as she sort of stuttered a word to ask her question, Tyson just sort of held his hand up and he just walked away, just dismissed her. And I thought he was brilliant. This is, I'm loving what they're doing with Tyson Kidd. I really am, even if he is blowing off Devin Taylor. And as I said before, everybody knows that I'm a big Devin Taylor fan. But no, I, I'm, I'm liking the direction that they're going in with Tyson because. He's never really had much of a character. Now that he's got one, he's pissing people off and it's great. And everybody loves it because he's actually doing something now, whereas he's never really done anything in the past, apart from when he was uh, with D.H. Smith and Natalia in the Hart Dynasty. He's not done anything else. And now that he's getting an opportunity to do something, he's drawn in a lot of attention from fans. So, no, it's good to see. Uh, segment three, or the second match of the night, uh, Hunakara, as I like to call him, versus Wesley Blake. Um, it was an okay match. Wesley Blake, he's a, he's quite a grind and pound kind of guy, whereas uh, Hunakara is obviously a high flyer. And the contrasting styles actually worked really well um, with each other. You know, I think Hunakara, he's he's one of the most versatile guys on the main roster, on well, on either roster really. Um, you know. I could compare him to Cody Rhodes, where Cody's had a change of gimmick and he's completely changed his moveset, which is the same as what Hunakara's done. You know, he started off as uh, the Black Scene Kara when he first came in, and he had all these high flying moves and such. And when he was unmasked by Mr. Kara, he became this sort of grind and pound guy. You know, a lot more, a lot more of a technical game to him as opposed to the high fly, and I think he still used the high angle sent on, which is how he won this match. Um, but he, he, he was more of a ground and pound guy, more sort of grapple, he's more of a grappler than a, a high flyer. And then now that he's back under the uh, Hunakara gimmick, he's he's a high flyer again. So, you know, that shows real good versatility from him. You know, you don't get that out of many guys. As I mentioned, you've got him, you've got Cody Rhodes, and I can't really think of many others off the top of my head. So, you know, Hunakara or Hunako as a performer, you know, he's very much under the radar of a lot of people. I've always liked Hunakara. I've said it on the show before. I liked him when he was with uh, Camacho as a tag team. And I thought that if Mr. Kara hadn't been fired, Hunico would have stayed 
in the tag team with Camacho. Camacho would probably still be in the company. And you never know, they might have defeated the Ascension eventually to become the NXT Tag Team Champions, or they might have had a decent little run on the main roster. Not necessarily as champions, but actually getting some TV time. But unfortunately, that's, you know, that's hindsight, that's 2020 vision. Um, as I say, Hunakara won the match with a top rope sent on. Um, it was an okay match. Um, oh, and Drake Younger was the referee for this match. I believe it was his debut as a referee on the show, so. There's one for the indie fans there. Uh, the next part of the show was the CJ Parker promo that I was talking about. CJ Parker and Xavier Woods. Um, CJ, he calls him out basically. And he's saying that there's a few things that he said last week that he wasn't very proud of. Um, so he calls him down to sort of apologise to him. And Xavier Woods comes down looking very sharp in his suit. CJ offers an apology to Xavier his comments but Xavier is not believing anything he says you know I'm a smart guy I know you're chatting shit basically and he's not he's not falling for him as I say he's not falling for what he's saying um, Parker tells Woods he's offering peace and suggests that Xavier accepts his apology uh, but Woods basically just blows him off literally he sort of Parker held out his hand to shake Woods' hand Wood sort of held out a hand to shake it and then he pulled his, he sort of clenched a fist and pulled his hand up to his mouth and then <laughs> sort of blew into his hand and sort of just gave him a peace sign right up in his face and walked off. And as he walked off, as he was leaving the ring, CJ hit him in the back of the head with a heel kick. I say hit him, he missed him by a country mile. And that was the one thing that pissed me off. It was a really good promo, it was a really good segment. And it was just, it just killed it. You know, as much as it was one of the two things that saved the show for the mic work, you missed him by a fucking mile, honestly. But as uh, Xavier was sort of lying under the ropes, Parker pulled him up. I can't remember if he had his head draped over the bottom rope or the middle rope, but whichever rope it was, he sort of had him ready to beat the shit out of him, like punching him in the face. He, well, he didn't punch him, but he was going to punch him. And the referees came down to stop it, and CJ walked off to his awesome music. Honestly, I, I absolutely love the song. On the Streets by the LA Drugs, absolutely brilliant. And it fits his character well better than, as I said last week, better than that generic fucking hippie music, which is just god awful. Uh, next segment of the night, or the next match of the night, rather, Bullshit Dempsey, as I like to call him, versus Angelo Dawkins. It was a quick match. Dempsey basically dominated it from bell to bell. Uh, he won with his body slam slash slight side slam combination. Everything about this guy just screams at me. Generic! He is so fucking boring, honestly. His music's boring. His music just goes, ball! And he's got like a bit of music in, like for five seconds and it goes, ball! Again. And I'm just waiting for the day the fans turn around and just say, say shit after it says ball. Because this guy is bullshit. He is fucking awful. His moveset's generic. Actually, he didn't. One thing that sort of impressed me, simple wrestling move. It was a like a, a side headlock takeover. If I'm only being impressed by a side headlock takeover, this guy ain't going to make it. Well, no, he probably will make it because WWE likes these big guys for some reason. But his mic skills are awful as well. Very sort of like, he called, what was it he called himself? The last, the last real man in wrestling or something. Something like Silas Young would say. And it was just, really? I just want to kill myself listening to this guy and watching him in the ring because he's just... He, if I didn't do this show, I would fast forward his matches. Same with Mojo Rawley. That's how much this guy fucking bores me. He is awful. Honestly. He's fucking shit. Bullshit. Dempsey. Uh, next segment, we had Sami Zayn interviewing Adrian Neville. Yes, you heard that correctly. Sami Zayn asked Adrian Neville why he helped him last week um, when he was being attacked by Justin Gabriel and Tyson Kidd. Neville basically said that he and Sammy have known each other for a long time. He considers him a mate um, and he'll always have his back. Basically, just to the promo. Uh, obviously, they spoke briefly about the match that they got coming up and just said, you know, Tyson and Justin better watch out, basically. That was, that was the basic gist of it. It was quite pointless, really, I thought. What was done there could have been done in like a backstage segment, not 
obviously this was a backstage segment, but like in the locker room. Or Devin Taylor could have interviewed the both of them. But I don't know. It it was good for what it was, but it just it wasn't necessary really. But hey ho, it's done now, isn't it? What's done is done as they say. Um we're up to the main event now. Sammy, Sammy and Adrian versus Tyson Kidd and Justin Gabriel and Natalia was, she came out with Tyson to be in their corner. And it was a really good tag team match. It really was. You know, if these guys could make it up to the main roster as tag teams, that division is going to be a hell of a lot better than what it is now. You know, don't get me wrong. It is improving. You know, you've got a few sort of legitimate teams out there or teams that have now got good chemistry. But it's, it it would improve it so much if these two teams were up there. International airstrike, they had a good little run as a tag team before uh, Tyson had his injury. And as I said before, I saw them in Cardiff a few years back and they were just brilliant. They really were brilliant. And uh, Sami Zayn and Adrian Neville, you know, I think they've um, wrestled each other on a on an episode of main event of superstars on a main roster um, when when the WWE were over here in, in the UK. But I'd love to see both, well, all four guys up in the main roster at some stage over the next year. You know, obviously Tyson and Justin have had their time up there. Sammy and Neville haven't been given the opportunity yet, but I don't think there's anyone more ready than Sammy Zane to go up there, to be honest. So hopefully over the next six months or so, we'll see these guys back up there and sort of making their debuts up there. But no, it's a really good tag team match. It's refreshing to see four guys who I like to call real wrestlers, you know. They're not these big guys like Bullshit Dempsey and Mojo fucking Rawley. They're proper wrestlers. You know, they really take their craft seriously. They've wrestled all over the world, all four of them. And they've, they're, they're top, well, Tyson and Justin are two of the most underrated guys on the main roster. Sammy's probably the best wrestler in developmental roster. And he's closely followed by Adrian Neville. And that's what I mean by these guys are real wrestlers, you know. Um, but the end of, end of the match was done really well. Also, actually, I'll talk about the highlight of the match first. For me, it was um, Neville and Zayn were making sort of frequent tags, and Justin was the legal man for the heel team. And Neville tagged, sorry, yeah, Neville tagged in from Zayn, so Zayn tagged them in. And Zayn gets on all fours, sort of in the middle of the ring, and Justin's led down just to the side of him. And Neville climbs up on his back, quite dangerous, I suppose, in a way, because he could have done Zane some damage, but he climbed up on his back and he hit a corkscrew moonsault off of Sammy's back onto Justin. It was really well done because he he didn't have much, like, sort of elevation off the mat to begin with, but he got himself a good bit of height off of it and a good, you know, it was really well executed. Quite dangerous, as I say, you know, jumping off of a man's back, putting all your weight down to spring off of him, but... It was a good little spot. It was my favourite part of the match. Um, the end of the match was quite impressive as well, really. Uh, Tyson was uh, the legal man with Sammy. Uh, Zane, uh, sorry, Zane. Neville and Justin Gabriel were on the outside of the ring. And uh, Tyson ran at Zane to sort of hit him with a clothesline to take him over the top rope. But Zane elevated him up over the top. And he hit the floor. And he went down sort of clutching his knee. Zane hit the ropes on the far side of the ring and came back towards the entrance ramp side of the ring where all three guys were. And he hit a uh, diving sent on over the top rope and landed on all three guys. And Tyson's there clutched his knee again. Sammy throws him back into the ring. He scrambles into the corner down by the timekeeper's area, sort of holding his knee. And Natalia comes up onto the apron to sort of see if he's okay. Uh, the referee doesn't let Sammy attack him. He's sort of getting a bit pissed off. And when he th- when Tyson thinks Sammy's guard's down, he goes after him. He's playing possum, basically. He goes after him, and Sammy pushes him off. As he sort of fends him off, uh, Tyson knocks Natalia off the apron. And what pissed me off is that Natalia went down as though she's not a wrestler, and she doesn't know how to take a bump. Obviously, she is a wrestler, and she does know how to take a bump. She's the best female wrestler in the WWE, hands down. But it, it, that was the, the one little blemish on the match, really. You know, it was obviously done for storyline purposes. Um, you know, oh, a man hit a woman kind of thing. But Natalia's probably fought blokes on hundreds of occasions in her life, if not thousands of occasions. So I didn't buy into it, obviously. Um, 
they both sort of like blame each other, Kid and Zane blame each other for a few seconds, and then they sort of mutually agree, look, we better go and check on her, see if she's okay. So as Zane's getting out of the ring, Tyson rolls him up, one, two, three, and he wins the match. And instead of checking on his wife, he goes off to the uh, entrance ramp, and Renee Young and uh, Rich Brennan are sort of saying, well, obviously he cares more about the win than he does about his wife. And uh, Jason Albert says, you know, I'm sure that's not the case. And he, he does actually go back to get Natalia to take her off and, you know, make sure she's okay. And the show closed out with Justin Gabriel and Tyson Kidd celebrating at the, on the top of the ramp. Anyway, end of the show, as I say, overall rating, I give it a 7 out of 10. Um, and that was simply saved by the main event and by... CJ Parker and Xavier Woods' promo, with the exception of that heel kick that he completely fucking missed him with. But you can't win them all. It was a good segment. Aside from that, you can't sort of hold back a segment on one blemish. Uh, next week, we've got... Uh, sorry, not next week. In two weeks' time, as I said earlier, we've got Charlotte versus Summer Rae uh, for the NXT Women's Championship. That's the July the 24th episode. And Tyler Breeze, there's still no sign of when he'll cash in his uh, title match. It was announced, like, Eden did the whole, ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Breeze has entered the building, but he didn't actually show up on the on the episode. So it was a bit weird that they did it like that. Normally they will sort of say, he's here, and then he'll have a match. Then the next match, they'll say Tyler Breeze has left the building. But it's just a bit weird that they did it that way. Um, this week's news. Sorry, I had a swig of my drink there. This week's news. Um, Kenta signed for the WWE this morning. And that's a big signing for me. Even at his, he's 30. And I've always said, you know, if you're 30 years old and not made it to the main roster yet, you're probably not going to make it. But Kenta's an exception to that rule, I would think, because of his, you know, he's he's Kenta. <laughs> I've, not, I've not seen a lot, a lot of him. I have seen bits of him and I know his credentials and what he brings to the table. He's a hell of a wrestler, a hell of a worker. He's done a bit of work for Ring of Honor before. So, uh, yeah, he's done work in America for Ring of Honor, I should have said, rather. So he's sort of... He, know, he kind of knows the American style, I suppose. And obviously he'd be down in NXT. I'm hoping he's only going to be down there for about six months. I'd like to see him on the WrestleMania card to help promote it for the Japanese. Um, obviously, you know, for like every other country, you know, for Ireland, you'll have Seamus there. For England or Britain, we'll have like Page and Wade Barrett and hopefully Adrian Neville if he's on the main roster. But then obviously, you're always going to get Canadians and Mexicans on there. Um, but no, I'd like to see Ken today. I can't remember the last time he had a Japanese guy on a WrestleMania card, excluding Aki Bono. I would imagine it was something like Holtmo Dragon or Tajiri or something like that. But, um, no, it'd be, it'd be good for the Japanese to have that kind of thing because, as I said, they've not had it for a little while. So, um, Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with Kent as well. I, I, I'm guessing they're going to keep his name because they've been promoting him on WWE.com as, you know, Kent has signed for WWE. But we'll see. No doubt they'll end up fucking it up and giving him some sort of crappy generic Japanese name. Um, the next one is a, a guy I don't know. A whole lot of bite, really. Tyson Ducks, he had a tryout match before SmackDown this week. Um, I think he lost to Sin Cara. But, as I said, I don't know a lot about him. I keep meaning to go onto YouTube to find out a bit more, like watch a few matches, or whatever. I just not had a chance to do it this week. But, something I'm looking forward to, you know, it's always nice to see new guys making their mark and, you know, getting these tryouts. And if they get signed, you think, oh, yeah, no, I remember when he had his tryout match, and, you know, he's quite impressive, or on the opposite side of the thing. On the opposite side of that, you think, I fucking hate this guy, he's shit. But, so I don't know a lot about him or anything about Tyson Ducks, really. So something I'm going to have to get on to. But if anyone knows anything about him, just send me a tweet at Axel Mulligan. Uh, last bit of news is um, Santino. He didn't announce his retirement this week, but he was strongly hinting at his retirement this week. He didn't sort of say in so many words, I'm retired, but it's... Um, He's retired, basically. He's had a third neck injury. He's not been able to recover. Well, he, he, he's, he's fucked, basically. His neck's fucked. And it's quite sad. He's only 35 years old. And to have your career ended at such a young age is just not good. But um, 
He did say he's not going to be leaving the WWE, be hanging around in some sort of capacity. I'd like to see him as a trainer because despite the comedic gimmick and, you know, the, the lack of wrestling prowess that he shows on Raw and SmackDown, or he showed rather, I should say now, he is a good fighter. If ever you've seen any of his OVW stuff, he's he he was a standout guy, you know. And he's got his own like wrestling school, so obviously he's he's confident in his own abilities as a wrestler to be able to train other people. And you know he's got a bit of a mixed martial arts background as well, so he can you know the sky's the limit for this guy now um, backstage if he doesn't get some sort of on screen role. You know he's he's. If he does get an on-screen role, he's definitely got the charisma and the mic skills to be able to get over maybe a capacity of like a manager or a general manager or something along those lines. But it's not, as I said, it's not nice to see that he's had to call it quits in the ring because he's, as much as I didn't like the character, and I don't, I, I speak for pretty much everybody, I think, when I say that. As I said, it's not nice when, obviously, this is, been his dream for however many years it's been to be a wrestler and he's, he's had it taken away through something that unfortunately couldn't have been prevented you know it's another injury injuries happen and same as uh cory graves last week you know got you talk about guys with guys like edge and stone cold steve austin ricky the dragon steamboat not nice not nice at all this week's birthday speaking of rich ricky the dragon steamboat July the 7th was his son Richie Steamboat's birthday. He was 27. July the 8th, Mark Miro, 54. July the 9th, Shelton Benjamin, 39. And Kevin Nash, 55. July the 10th, Gilberg, 55. And Bobo Brazil would have turned 90. Um, July the 11th, Butch Reed would have, been, uh, sorry, Butch Reed turned 60. Brock Lesnar, 37. Tyson Kidd, 34. Sami Zayn, 30. July the 12th, so today. Gregory Helms turned or turning 40 today, and tomorrow Sean Waltman, aka X Pac, 42. I've got a lot on this uh, this week in wrestling history. Uh, July the 7th, Booker T, 2003. So it was Booker T defeated Christian to become the IC champion. They had a little feud over the belt in 2003. It got reinstated. It was um, vacated or sort of merged with the World Heavyweight Championship at No Mercy in 2002 uh, when Triple H beat Kane for the belt. One of my fa- all-time favourite pay-per-views that. Phenomenal show. Um, but they reinstated it at Judgment Day in 2003 and Booker defeated Christian to become the new IC champion on Raw um, a couple of months later, July 7th. Um, I believe shortly after that, Booker lost the belt back to Christian. It was Booker's only reign as champion, I know that, but no, they had a good little feud over the belt, to be fair. Uh, remember a match they had at Bad Blood as well. Good little feud, as I say. Um, July the 9th, the APA defeated the Dudley Boys to win their last uh, WWF, as it was at the time, WWF Tag Team Championships. That was on Raw in 2001. July the 11th, uh, Finley defeated Bobby Lashley to become the US Champion. That was uh, Finley's only uh, championship win in the WWE. July the 12th, Chris Benoit defeated William Regal on Velocity. And some of you are going to be thinking, why the fuck is he talking about a Velocity match? Because it was a fucking awesome match, that's why. It was absolutely amazing. You know, you don't kind of, you never saw those kinds of matches on Sunday Night Heat, especially in the latter years of Sunday Night Heat and Velocity. But this match, it was, it was about a 20 minute match. And it was just, Perfect. It was wrestled so perfectly. And you got two in ring technicians, technical masters, Chris Benoit and William Regal. What a match, honestly. One of those matches, I know I say this a lot, and you probably think, fucking hell, he's saying it again. If you've not watched it, watch it. And I'll leave it at that. July the 13th, uh, JBL defeated Eddie Guerrero in a cage match to retain his WWE Championship on SmackDown in 2004. This closed out the JBL and Eddie Guerrero feud, albeit temporarily they had one match later in the year for the belt at Armageddon. Uh, it was a fatal fallaway. But JBL defeated Eddie in a cage match. Um, he'd won the title about two weeks prior at the Great American Bash. And Eddie invoked his rematch clause in what a cage match. So 
both men are sort of trying to climb out the cage. Remember it so vividly. Both men are trying to climb out the cage and El Gran Luchador, who's a inverted commas, the Mexican champion, who's a, obviously like a false thing the WWE had made up, climbed over the cage. Everybody thinks he's going to help out Eddie. No. He holds on to Eddie's legs, pulls him back down, and JBL climbs out of the ring, retains his title. El Gran Luchador, Eddie's obviously pissed off. El Gran Luchador tries climbing out over the top rope, sorry, over the top of the cage on the opposite side of the ring, sort of going down towards the ramp. But as he does, Eddie sort of scrambles over and he manages to grab his mask and rip his mask off, revealing the supposedly disabled general manager of SmackDown, Kurt Angle. And that sort of re-sparked their feud, what they had in 2004. And the following week, Kurt was fired as the general manager of SmackDown. I believe he was replaced by Teddy Long. Tag team matches. Yeah. Um, they had a match at SummerSlam, and it was, it was, it was, lo- it was the longest one-sided match I've ever seen in my life. And I remember watching it back then. Uh, not watched it since, because it, it didn't bury Eddie. But the match was pointless having it booked as it was. Everybody, like, it was almost to remind us of how good Kurt Angle was. But in the space of, what are we talking, four or five months, you're not going to forget how great a wrestler Kurt Angle was, honestly. But I didn't understand why they booked it the way they did, but hey ho. Um, I'm going to have a bit of a main roster rant. Not something I normally do, but I feel it's worthy of it. Why the hell? It's something quite, I was on James Power's show this week, and I put the question out on Twitter. I put I mentioned it on James's show as well. Why the hell is our United States heavyweight champion Sheamus involved in the WWE Intercontinental Championship Battle Royal at Battleground in a couple of weeks' time? I don't I don't understand it because there was talk a little while back of like merging the titles. Never happened. That was when Ambrose and Big E were champions. Then the talk, it, the talk stopped. You know, the, the champions, you didn't really see a collision between the two champions, which is the way I'd, I'd like to see it, really. I'd like having two separate belts. As well. like, I think that the, inner, uh, sorry, the WWE and the World Heavyweight Championship should be separated again, but that's not going to happen. Anyway. Seamus has been talking on Twitter and on Instagram about unifying the titles and calling it, number one, the one thing, the first thing that pissed me off, calling it the United States Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship. Isn't it calling the United States Intercontinental title a bit redundant? Because intercontinental means all continents. And then if you call it the United States Intercontinental, the United States isn't even a continent. So you're talking about a title for a country between all continents. Another bit of uh, another bit of shit from the WWE there that they've been giving us. The second thing is that I think that if you're unifying titles, you need to build a feud between the two champions. They did it well for John Morrison and The Miz when... The World Tag Team Titles and the WWE Tag Team Titles were merged back in, I think it was like 2010. Um, they they merged the titles with uh, Carlito and Primo. I think that was at WrestleMania, actually. And Carlito and Primo came out on top. And that, that was booked well. When they had the first Undisputed Champion in 2001, that was done well. When they merged, <coughs> excuse me, when they merged the WWE and World Heavyweight Championships in 2000, well, back end of 2013 last year, that wasn't done so well, but there was a couple of good matches for the title. Despite what people think, I thought the Royal Rumble match was a good match between Orton and Cena. Um, so yeah, it just doesn't make sense why they would, like, even consider merging the titles without a feud. It's just like, well, we've got a vacated title here. Why don't we just give it to this champion? You might as well just give him the fucking belt if that's what you're going to do. It just doesn't make sense. For me, Cesaro's got to win that match. But 
We'll see what happens in a few weeks' time. Um, that's the end of the show. Shoutouts as usual. Uh, Tim Vicious and at Tim underscore Vicious. Make sure you look out for Tim's YouTube show, Vicious Rants, every Tuesday. Does a really good show. Covers rules and pay per views. Uh, Sunday segue every Sunday. Kenny and Shug's always got an array of guests on the show. Uh, I'm going to be on, I believe, at the end of the month for my Beat the Clock challenge with uh, Michael Cook. But I believe it's the week where Kenny's off um, and James will be filling in. And looking forward to it because I always sit there when we're doing the beat when they do the Beat the Clock, and I'm always answering the questions. But I can guarantee that I will fucking freeze when it comes to it. But we'll see. I'm looking forward to it. I know Mike is as well. So all the best to you, Michael, if you're listening to this, mate. Um, speaking of James, his show, um, follow him on Twitter at JamesPowers33. Uh, as I said, I was on his show this week. had a really good time shooting the breeze with him, uh, Matthew French, and Michael was on there as well, actually, uh, Michael Cook. Uh, at PW Smart Talk at Wrestling Rambles and at Tony Walker uh, sorry at Tony underscore Walker follow Tony's uh, podcast page on Twitter as well at WM Podcast that's for the Wrestling Matters podcast where he puts that up on Podomatic and YouTube Um, but yeah thanks for listening everybody as always and uh, I'll see you again soon